Flying robots and CIA agents. Jack, a man in his 20s, diagnosed with schizophrenia, paced the streets. He heard buzzing, which he attributed to attacking robots, and he swung his body around in defense. He was convinced CIA agents lurked in the bushes, and so he looked around suspiciously. He was completely alone in this world of imaginary intruders, yet he was surrounded by real people. Jack had not seen a psychiatrist in weeks, and he was off his medications, leaving him agitated and paranoid. Like so many times in the past, someone became fearful and called the police. Jack was arrested for disturbing the peace, and he was brought to the hospital. As a medical student, I first met Jack in the locked ward where he's being held for treatment. As part of the medical team, I worked to change his medications to better control his psychosis, to make those attacking robots and CIA agents disappear. His stay in the hospital was obviously meant to be therapeutic. But while he was with us, he missed several probation hearings for past offenses. He lost access to low-income housing, and he was kept out of the workforce. Jack's story is all too emblematic of those with serious mental illness in the United States. It is a story characterized by inadequate solutions, broken systems, and the need for something more, something additional with the capacity to heal. Serious mental illness, though, is not limited to schizophrenia. It includes any mental illness that causes significant impairment in daily life activities, like working. It includes the brother with severe anxiety, the grandfather with PTSD, and the mother with bipolar disorder. Think of those in your life who have struggled with mental illness. They are not alone. There are 44 million American adults with mental illness. 44 million. That's more than the population of California. And there are 10 million American adults with serious mental illness, more than the population of New York City. These statistics include my own family. Growing up, I watched loved ones battle mental illness. I remember sitting in folding chairs at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, listening to poignant stories of relapse and recovery. I remember patiently waiting for the visiting hours to begin at the residential center for substance abuse. As much as I wanted to help, I was a kid. Granted, I was a scrappy kid. <laughs> I was still a kid who had enough trouble talking to girls or choosing a username for AOL Instant Messenger. <laughs> massive, massive challenge. And so clearly, I was limited in what I could do. These experiences, this feeling of helplessness, sparked my initial interest in mental illness and medicine. I became convinced if I wanted to help those with serious mental illness like Jack, if I wanted to be a resource to my family, I needed to become a doctor. Full disclosure, I also thought the doctors on ER were badass. <laughs> so I had mixed motives, but I convinced Stanford to take me in. And I immediately started looking for opportunities to get involved. I joined a research team that studies early childhood trauma and designed psychiatric services for low-income communities. I managed a mental health clinic for adults without insurance. These experiences deepened my resolve to address mental illness, but they also gave me insight into the very real constraints of my chosen field. It's true I met doctors who treated patients with compassion and skill, but just a fraction of those who needed treatment got it, and often after waiting a long time. And as with other diseases, it's really tough to monitor because patients are rarely in the clinic. I also got exposure to the role of government, I met a bunch of patients who went months, if not years, with no treatment, who finally got connected to doctors thanks to government programs and clinics. The reality, though, is these efforts are totally insufficient. I gradually came to this realization, but it was my experience with Jack that really crystallized it. I recognized that Jack needed more than what healthcare and government could offer. To lead a healthier, fuller life, Jack needed an additional ally. 
So what do you do in the case of serious mental illness when healthcare and government fall short? I decided to apply to business school. <laughs> it was either this or management consulting. I think I made the right decision. But after spending many years in the Bay Area, I really grew an appreciation for the ability of business to create products and solutions for unmet needs. And I saw tremendous potential for its application to serious mental illness. I came to the conclusion that as business leaders, we are uniquely positioned to tackle the problems made visible by Jack's story. Every day, we see all around us how business can grow economies, build personal fortune, and transform the world. I argue business also has the capacity to heal. Since starting business school, I've come across a number of companies in the Bay Area that are working on mental illness. I'm here today not talking to you as an entrepreneur, an investor, or an employee, but rather as a family member and as a future doctor. I want to share just two companies that have developed products that are enabling physicians to better treat those with serious mental illness. These products are not yet widely available, but they offer a glimpse into the potential of business, its potential and its capacity to heal. Jack's illness is not static. We met him in the hospital, but he can go long stretches of time in the community doing just fine. But when he has a psychotic break, his schizophrenia is totally debilitating. Each episode sets him further and further back, and intervening early is tough. Ginger I.O. might offer a solution. It's a mobile app that collects data on a patient's mobility, communication, and sleep patterns. With this information, as Jack's doctor, I could know when his behavior is making a major departure from his normal routine. Ginger I.O. would enable me to anticipate Jack's psychotic breaks and to intervene before hospitalization. I'd be the first one to tell you that Jack's medications are not perfect, but he functions and he feels a lot better when he takes them. But he's just like the rest of us and he often forgets to take his medications. Proteus Digital Health, the second company, is working to improve medication adherence. It has developed a tiny ingestible sensor that fits inside individual pills. When you take the pill, it's activated by the fluids in your stomach and a signal is sent to a patch on your skin. That patch, in turn, communicates with a smartphone, which collects data on medication adherence. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Stay with me. With Proteus as Jack's doctor, I could know when he is off his medications, and I could help him reach his goal of leading a healthier life. Imagine what future solutions could be designed if more business leaders like us applied our creativity and our acumen towards serious mental illness. Imagine how Jack's life could be different if he had access to Ginger I.O. and Proteus. And now take that impact and multiply it by the 10 million other American adults with serious mental illness. In this way, business has the capacity to heal. Our inadequate response to serious mental illness is a glaring example of our collective failure to serve some of the weakest members in our society. While this failure is largely hidden, mental illness touches all of our lives. Business and technology are not perfect solutions, but they have incredible potential to help. As business leaders, we have the ability to transform what is today to what can be tomorrow. My journey, which now includes medicine and business, is still uncharted, as is yours. As you leave today, and as you look to your own future, I simply ask you to be more inclusive, to include Jack as you go out to reshape the world. Thank you.